The following is an edited recording from a live video broadcast. Image and audio quality may vary. Uh, myself and a whole bunch of dudes ran a convention uh, called Con 9 for Matter Space, and it was a one-off event. It was a weekend devoted solely to classic golden age cinema, movies, TV shows, and even radio plays uh, from back then. Uh, we had so obviously some people dressed in costumes. We had some displays and some robots and all the rest of it, So, which was absolutely fantastic. But the thing that we did, uh for the event um is that prior to the convention occurring we put the word out to all these people and we said okay name your top five sci-fi movies and we um got all those numbers together and we did a panel at the end of the convention discussing the top 20 right so this is what we're going to do tonight right so it's actually the top 20 classic uh sci-fi films just movies from before 1965 so all right we move on number 14 I can tell you what it's not. It's not Abbott and Costello go to Mars. Uh, it is, in fact, something which could potentially happen if you sit and think about it. Something on Earth for a change. Of course, it was, uh, was Day of the Triffids. Right. So two things happen in this, right? Meteor things fly over the Earth and blind everybody. And then the freaking plants come to light. Life uproot themselves. Go around killing dudes. What's the deal with that? So uh, there you go. The Triffids, they pop up out of the ground when everybody's as blind as a bat. Visual impairment, here we come, and uh, they're going around killing dudes. And uh, tell you what, I reckon in the – I think this came out in the early 60s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this The audience would have been shitting themselves over this one because you actually do physically see the plants walking around, and right? And they're killing dudes, read them. It's like, how radical is that? So um, I like the fact – because the name, Triffids doesn't mean anything. You don't really know what it is. But when they say Day of the Triffids, it's plants, mate, killer plants. Oh, and they're big-ass plants too, so – there you go. Uh, and you are right, Risky Bays. A lot of this gets ref referenced in the Rocky Horror Picture Show in the opening song, uh, Science Fiction, double feature. And, uh, yeah, it's all Janet Scott, the fighter tripper that spits poison and kills. Yeah, exactly right. So if you're a big fan of Rocky Horror Picture Show, a lot of this will actually make a lot of sense to you, which is particularly grippy. So there you go. <laughs> Grab the weed whacker. Tell you what, you're going to need more than you're going to have to drop it like from um, airplanes or something if you're going to knock these uh, particular weeds out. So... What can I say about that <laughs> weed whacker? So yeah, your weeding wand, it's going to be like a lightsaber, if anything, if you're going to use a weeding wand on a Triffid. So uh, mm, check that out. All right. So one of the things about classic sci-fi movies is, for the most part, they had relatively low budgets, right? They were pretty cheap. But sometimes you get a studio who goes, you know what? Let's chuck a few bucks into this, right? And this is going to be number 13. Let's go completely hardcore. Let's go full cinemascope. Let's go the whole bizzo. And, of course, it was Disney's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Oh, my goodness gracious me. Good old Captain Nemo and big-ass squids doing their thing. And good old Kirk Douglas and all the rest of it. Oh, huge cinemascope in colour. You know, when you look at it, you go, oi, there's a bit of money spent on this. And uh, this was a particularly fame. Look at that. The mightiest motion picture of them all. So, um yeah, a very, very impressive stuff. A really, really groovy. Looks absolutely I can't imagine seeing it on the cinema screen. It would have been spectacular at the time. Uh, and it was really, really good to see. And a few people voted for this one, which is particularly good. So I haven't watched it for a long, long time, I've got to be uh, honest with you, but uh, I certainly did appreciate it. And uh, they had some awesome, great moments in it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And Daniel E. Moneybag Sullivan said, one of my favorites as well. So 20,000 leagues under the sea. So there you go. Uh, and when we're saying leagues, we're talking about distances. We're not talking about like football leagues and cricket leagues, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. So, um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely magnificent movie and uh yeah it was disney's uh sticking their nose in going yep let's cash in make a really really big awesome movie and away we go so there you go how how far is it i've got no idea you know that is a damn good question and uh someone out there's probably like rates of knots and all the sort of bizzo yeah i've got no idea so if someone invents it if i was to say to you it's two and a half miles per league people go oh my god how do i know that stuff it's because i don't i just made it up all right now this particular movie came out there are some movies that have been selected by people and i go you know what I'm on board with that one. That is pushing my buttons. And I like my buttons being pushed. So I've got the shirt on. For those who haven't seen it, it's probably on here somewhere. Hang on, I'll just check over there. Number 12 coming up. Absolutely love this movie, even though by today's standards, it is a tad laughable. But uh, one league is 5.5 kilometres, and Ange has just made that up. But he's pulled that out of his furry one because he's got no freaking idea. I'm only gagging Ange. You probably looked it up. All right. So this particular movie, absolutely loved it. You've got to look past the... the humorous side and see from the serious side of course it was the fly um what i loved about this is it really dealt with the saga if you're a scientist and you make a massive cock up with your experiment how do you deal with it what do you do and how do you reverse the process and of course in the fly he's um 
had the accident because you don't see it actually occurring and he's hiding it from his wife uh, and he's got the fly head in the arm and all the rest of it and he's desperately trying to find a way to fix himself and she doesn't know what's going on. He's locked himself in the laboratory and all the rest of it. Sure, uh, the idea of a fly with a human head is kind of stupid, you know, and they did make two sequels to this movie too, by the way. Um, but I look past the the silliness of it because a lot of people thought, oh, he's got a fly head, that's a bit dorky. Uh, and even the uh, remake, they actually made a point of saying, uh, oh, am I going to be like a human with a fly head? But when you look at it, it's... Um, yeah, it has a lot going for it, and it's actually quite a serious film. What happens when you have an accident and you can't fix it? What do you do? And, of course, in the end, he has to kill himself. So, oh, spoiler alert, 70-year out-of-date spoiler alert, uh, he puts his head under a, a press and she kills him, and uh, and that's part of the whole story. So they find him dead, and, um, yeah, absolutely fantastic, fantastic movie. So uh, there are some really good, serious sci-fi movies made in this time, and, uh, and that's the key thing, and this was particularly one of them, so... <laughs> what a big blowy. Yeah, that's going to need to be a bit of more teen to get rid of, eh? So there you go. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, there we go. He's good with it. The band, the Bond version, the fly that bugged me. Yes, exactly right. Um, they didn't change it. Alpha said they didn't change anything from the written book. I'm kind of glad to hear that, actually. So, uh, yes, well worth checking out. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> the fly says, help me, Invisible Price hits it with a brick. It doesn't end well. So there are a couple of bits you can go, you know what, we probably could have done without that. But uh, the crux of the story is quite good. And the fact that... In the story, the wife killed the, the husband. Actually, so she was worried, but put him under the under the press and squashed him and all the rest of it. That's something you didn't see coming, and I thought that was actually particularly groovy. So there you go. Well worth checking out. The Fly, good stuff. You, you, whether you watch the other two is entirely up to you, but uh, sometimes stick with just the first one, as would be the case with this one. I hope The Vile is watching, because this is one that The Vile gets very excited about. Didn't make it to number 10, unfortunately, but, of course, it is The Creature from the Black Lagoon absolutely awesome stuff and uh yeah good, good old gill man doing his thing for whatever reason he's got the hots for the chick as you do in these movies and uh they're sailing around i think it was the amazon if i'm not mistaken and he's just doing his thing they made two sequels to this movie give him a miss especially the third one the creature walks among us which was complete shit but stick with the original and of course the original was in 3d and the vile has seen um, the 3D version, and I haven't. And I thought, I can't imagine what it'd be like in 3D. That'd be spectacular, even Russell said, yep, 3D. And, uh, which is particularly groovy. Uh, Rusky, oh, even Andrew's seen it in 3D, so that would be very, very groovy. And it's, it is a great film because the Gill Man is so convincing, right? And I'm sure his motives are a bit all ass about, what the hell is he trying to do? You know, he's killing dudes on the boat, he's trying to get the chick, and you know, all this sort of bizarre. But uh, you see him swimming in the water and all the rest of it. And, of course, he doesn't say a single word. And it's like, that is grouse. So uh, very, very cool. Uh, he saw it. Yep, he's seen it at the Valhalla. Oh, God. Valhalla was an independent cinema here that was around for many, many years. This is show a lot of really left field stuff. Uh, long gone now, but uh, has an institution for old dudes like myself. You remember uh, the time there very, very fondly. So, yes, exactly right. Uh, the Vile, uh, excited beyond repair. Exactly right. There's actually a big following for the, uh, the Gill Man. When I was in America a couple of years ago, there's actually like collectibles you can buy for Gill Man. He's, no one knows about who the other cast members are or the characters. I mean, obviously the cast members are Richard Carlson and Julie Adams, but um, no one gives a shit about any the human people. It's the Gill Man. He's the dude, mate. And uh, yeah, exactly right. So even Andrew seen at the Valhalla. Seems like the only one who didn't see at the Valhalla was me. Uh, and you are right, Mr. William. 24-hour sci-fi marathons at the Valhalla. For those who don't know about those, they used to start at 7.30 on the Saturday morning, finish at 7.30 on the Sunday morning. Used to show a mixture of old and new movies, and it was a great way of just catching up with stuff. There's a lot we could discuss regarding the Valhalla 24-hour marathons, but we don't really have time for that. But, um, yes, I've got to say, um, it was absolutely fantastic. In 3D, you can't knock it. But it didn't make the top 10. How disappointing is that? Next up, we count down from number 10 to number 6.